Welcome on stage one of this year's Digitale Leute Summit. So glad that there are so many people here for Martin's talk. And as we are in the beginning of the day, um, we will start to warm you up just a little bit. I was on stage at the conference stage um, some, some minutes ago, and to be honest, the applause was a bit lame. We, we won't have that here on stage. We can be a bit louder. We have so many great people on the stages, and I really want you to appreciate them. Who had coffee this morning? Okay, so we have a well-caffeinated crowd. So I hope you all <laughs> woke up, and um, we can just try that and pr practice a bit how to give proper credit and be a bit loud for the speakers we have on stage. Are you ready? Yes, okay. So in, in the morning at conference stage one here at Digitale Leute Summit, let's do the craziest test applause you ever did for Digitale Leute Summit. Good morning. <laughs> Fantastic, and with the same joy, I want to welcome our first speaker. He is a product partner at EQT Ventures and has over 25 years of experience in building digital products and digital product teams. He held roles at the Financial Times Monster Kazoo, for example. Please, warmly, loudly, joyfully welcome Martin Eriksson. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm here to talk about decisions. <laughs> Get applause, that's great. Whether you're a designer, a product manager, a developer, a startup founder, all you do all day long is make decisions. I might be most famous or infamous, depending on your perspective, for having drawn this Venn diagram that defines the definition of product as the intersection of the customer, the technology, and the business. But what I really should have drawn is this, because all we do is make decisions. And sometimes they become overwhelming. I know as a product manager, as an event manager, I've come home at the end of the day and been so exhausted from making decisions that I can't even decide what I want for dinner. How many of you have ever felt that overwhelmed by the number of decisions that you have to make? Just show of hands. Yeah, almost every hand went up. And you're not alone. I did a poll on Twitter over the summer that showed that 74% of the people who follow me, at least, uh, were overwhelmed at least once a week. So why are these decisions so overwhelming? Well, I want to take a step back and look at the psychology for a minute. And there's two factors at play. There's decision fatigue and the paradox of choice. We can map these on a two-by-two, two, like all good consultants would. On one axis, you have the number of decisions that you have to make every day. And it turns out that research shows that we make a staggering 35,000 decisions a day. Even in the minute and a half since I came on stage, you've all been making decisions. Should you sit up straight? Should you slouch down? Should you answer that notification that just came through on your phone or leave it alone? A lot of these are obviously unconscious or subconscious, but they still add up. If you drove here today, research shows that you make 200 decisions for every mile of driving. Today, we'll make over 200 decisions just about food. Now, again, a lot of these are unconscious, but we make about 100 conscious decisions a day, and that's before we started working in product. So Roy Biomaster and John Tierney did a lot of research around this, and in their book, Willpower, showed that the more decisions that you have to make throughout the day, the harder each one becomes. Now, the research around this is still ongoing. If any psychologists in the room know that there's a lot of research about this, some of the methods behind this book are kind of being debunked. There was other research that showed that it was all tied to blood sugar levels that has been debunked. So the research is still ongoing about why this happens, 
but I think we can all agree that it does happen. <laughs> and so as those number of decisions go up, we hit decision fatigue. But there's a second axis about the number of options that each of those decisions brings. Imagine you're going into a supermarket and you just think, I'm thirsty. The choice is quite literally overwhelming. Do you want milk? Do you want flavored milk? Do you want coffee with milk? Do you want coffee on its own? Do you want water? OK, do you want sparkling water, still water, flavored water, water with vitamins? There's probably a diet water out there. It's overwhelming. As Barry Schwartz showed, and he's an author, a psychologist, a professor, who started a lot of research around this, the more decisions, uh, the more options you add to your list, the more trade-offs you have to make. And those trade-offs have very real psychological consequences. The greater the variety of choices, the worse you actually feel. Of course, the economists say that zero choice is the fastest route to low quality. And we've all seen that in any market that's dominated by a few single players or by a monopoly. User experience goes down, product quality goes down, because they can get away with it, because we don't have a choice. So of course, there's a middle ground. And Sheena Yengar, who actually started a lot of the research that uh, Barry wrote the book about, and has continued to do the research over decades after that, has found that when you're given a small number of choices, probably three or four, versus a large number, anything over 10, you're more likely to actually make a choice in the first place. You're happier with that choice, and you're more confident in the choice. So going back to that supermarket example, instead of going in thinking, I'm thirsty, which you probably don't do that often. You're probably going in thinking, oh, I need something to pick me up, so I want something with caffeine. And actually, I want something that doesn't have sugar. And suddenly, your choices are narrowed down, and it's much easier to pick a product and leave the store. And this has to do with math, right? So trade-offs come with a cost, but it's quite easy to map it out, right? If you have one, two options, you're choosing between Coke and water, it's one trade-off. Four options, six trade-offs. Eight options, 28 trade-offs. It works the same as network effects, works the same as um, anything like that. 16 options is 120 trade-offs. Now, this doesn't mean we always do A to B, B to C, C to B, D to A. We're not making each individual trade-off, but it's still a psychological cost that you're thinking through. So with the number of decisions, we get decision fatigue. With the number of options for each decision, we have the paradox of choice. And it's no wonder, then, that we end up with decision overload in all of our jobs. So how do we think about moving down and becoming, reducing the number of decisions and reducing the number of choices and being more deliberate about the decisions that we make? Because unlike all the other two-by-twos you've ever seen, you do not want to be in the top right corner of this two-by-two. -two. Well, one way to do that is to do what Barack Obama, Mark Zuckerberg, and Steve Jobs have in common. Does anyone know what that is? Other than being middle-aged men? They all wear the same clothes every day. And they've all explicitly come out and said that they do that in order to limit the number of decisions they have to make in any given day. <clears throat> so that might be a bit extreme, but what does that mean for product decisions? Well, first of all, don't offer too many choices in your product. But other people have spoken and written much more eloquently than I ever will about that. So go read those books, watch those talks, and that's a talk for another time. But just as importantly, we have to rethink how we make decisions about our products. And product decisions become overwhelming because of something I call the paradox of autonomy. Now, if you've ever read my book or read my writing, hopefully you all know that I'm a big, big believer in autonomous, empowered, cross-functional teams, that they have to own the product, and that that's how you build successful product teams. Or as Steve Jobs said, we hire smart people, not so, that they can, not so we can tell them what to do, but so they can tell us what to do. But left unchecked, autonomy can get a little chaotic. If you've ever worked in a really small startup that's starting to scale, everyone starts running off in different directions. Everyone's kind of doing whatever they think is the most important thing. You have this one guy down in the bottom right corner who's like, I have this amazing idea, and nobody's listening. 
So as Jeff Bezos said, success comes from alignment around high quality and high velocity decisions. So in our hypothetical store of product, you have a lot of choices. You can go in many different directions. You can build anything with modern technology. But you have to answer the question of where do you actually want to go? And start aligning on that direction. This doesn't mean you're taking away autonomy. There's still a lot of choice. There's still a lot of options that you have to figure out. You have to go do the research. You have to go talk to your customers. There's still a lot of ownership of understanding exactly what choices to make but at least everyone's aligned on the same direction. So alignment means less decision overload, better decisions, and happier teams. Sounds great, right? How do we get started? Well, it all starts with a solid vision, and then translating that into a strategy of how you're going to achieve it, figuring out what the objectives are for the near term, what the opportunities that you want to pursue are, and what the principles are that underline that. This is a mental model that I've developed called the decision stack. Now, I'm not reinventing vision. I'm not reinventing strategy. These are known things. But all I'm doing is helping you connect the dots from top to bottom and bottom to top. And this is really powerful for a few different reasons. Number one, as you're developing this and as you're saying no, you have to be crystal clear about what you're saying no to. And that's just as important as what you say yes to. Now, this decision stack probably exists at many levels in your organization. If you're a bigger company, you have one at the company level, then you have one at the business line level, then you have one at the product level. You might not know it, but you have one. But if you're looking at a single product team or a single startup, the stack is pretty simple. And it helps you answer a couple of really important questions. So first of all, from the top down, it helps you answer how. How are we going to build this vision? Well, here's our strategy. How are we going to achieve that? Well, here are our objectives, and so on. But it's also really powerful from the bottom up, because it helps you ask the question, why? Why are we building this? Well, we're trying to achieve these objectives. Why are we doing that? Because it connects to this strategy, and so on. It also helps you notice when things don't fit into that agreed direction, because they don't stack up, and you can say no to this. It also helps you realize when things are missing and they can't connect those dots. And as we all know, when you take the wrong block out, the whole thing falls over. So as you heard in the introduction, I've been in product for over 25 years. I interviewed hundreds of product leaders for our book on product leadership. I now help over 95 portfolio companies at our venture fund with product challenges. And the two things I see missing the most often are strategy, and principles. Now, strategy to me is really kind of funny, right? Because if you've ever been in a business class, if you've ever done an MBA, all you talk about is strategy. There are literally hundreds of strategy frameworks out there. And this list is over 10 years old. So I don't know why we don't always start with this and why we don't have enough conversations about strategy. But it's pretty evident that in a lot of startups, we don't spend enough time on it. Now, I'm not dogmatic about which framework you use, but my favorite is SWOT analysis. And it's from 1969, so why aren't we doing this more often? If you've never done a SWOT analysis, it's a simple way to look at your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and threats. Strengths include your capabilities. Maybe you have unique capabilities in your team. You have a unique tech stack. You have unique market insights or distribution channels. Weaknesses include things like capacity, maybe you don't have the right skills, maybe you have a mountain of tech debt to get over. Opportunities might show you know, where the market's going, what are the trends happening out there. 15 years ago, if you were in mobile e-commerce, this was an opportunity for you, right? Moving into mobile, seeing that the trend in the market was everyone moving to handheld devices. Threats might include the opposite. If you were desktop e-commerce, suddenly everyone was moving to mobile and you were caught wrong-footed. But the most important thing here is that you're actually really honest. I think, especially as an investor now, we see a lot of decks that are just like rosy, beautiful pictures of this perfect world where we have all the capabilities, we're going to do everything, we're going to hit this perfect curve, and everything is going to be fine. But you really have to be honest, at least internally, about what's really your strengths and weaknesses and what can you do about them. But you also have to make it actionable. I think that's another missing step. 
And any product people in the room know how to do this, right? This is all that Marty Kagan and his books talk about. How do you make sure that what you're doing is valuable, usable, viable, and feasible? So to give you an example, as you heard, my, my last job before I became a VC was as the interim chief product officer for Kazoo. Now they looked at the UK used car market and saw this huge multi-multi-billion dollar or pound market, but saw that it was highly fragmented. So the biggest single actor in the UK at the time had a 2% market share. And that meant there was a huge long tail of really small businesses that had you know, five or 10 cars on their lot, and therefore the whole industry had kind of a famously terrible reputation for user experience. The opportunity was there's this huge market that's not even been touched by e-commerce, right? The rest of the UK market had about 25% e-commerce penetration before the pandemic, so but it was almost zero or maybe 1% in used cars, so that's a big opportunity. But also that it would take significant capital to succeed in this market. Threats included US companies already doing this in the US, pu big publicly listed companies that might want to come over to Europe. That company with 2% market share in the UK was still an eight or nine billion pound business. They could easily have chosen to invest in this, although we all know how hard it is to do digital transformation. And so the strategy was, yes, we have to build a great e-commerce experience, but that's kind of a solved problem, right? That's not rocket science anymore. We had to build an amazing operational capability because we wanted to be able to deliver a car anywhere in the UK within 48 hours. And then we had to raise enough money quickly enough in order to build a big business quickly. Because if you want to launch with 3,500 cars in your website, you have to spend a lot of money to do that. And there was only a few founders in the UK who could do that, including Alex Chesterman. And so we did all those things. Uh, they launched. They've done it incredibly well. Uh, they spacked on the New York Stock Exchange for over $8 billion just two years later. Now, in the years since they went public, the valuation has crashed a little bit because the market has us. But it's still a multi-billion pound business that has been built in a very short time and has a lot of great fundamentals that's going to make them a huge success. So strategy is hard, I get that, but it's not an excuse to avoid it. It also means that it's everybody's responsibility. So even if you're you know, a product manager, a designer, an engineer, and you think, oh, that's, that's leadership's problem, you need to understand strategy in order to be able to contribute to this conversation. So go and learn about it, read about it, and start with good strategy, bad strategy. It's one of the best books out there. At the other end of the stack, the other thing I see missing very often is principles. As Roy Disney, who is a nephew of founder Walt Disney and a senior executive at the Disney Company for many, many years, said, it's not hard to make decisions when you know what your principles are. I was lucky enough to learn this very early on. My first job as an actual product manager was at Monster in 1999. And can we all marvel at what the internet looked like in 1999? It's kind of cool. Monster obviously has a job board, is a two-sided marketplace, right? On the one hand, we have job seekers looking for jobs. On the other hand, we have recruiters looking for those job seekers. And so you can imagine every single product conversation has to talk about that trade-off. Every time we wanted to build a new feature, build a new initiative, it's like, do we do this in the job seeker-friendly way? Do we do this in a recruiter-friendly way? What are the trade-offs? And it would take a lot of time to have that conversation every single time. So a few months after I joined, I was in the US headquarters just outside Boston, and we're having the same debate about this, these features. <clears throat> and I saw our CEO and co-founder walk past, and I was like, Jeff, please, please come in here, help us make this decision. And he listened to us for a few minutes, and he's like, wait a minute. Job seekers always come first. If we build an amazing experience for them, then the recruiters will have to follow, because they're looking for that audience. And so we didn't call it a principle at the time, but it, it became a kind of fundamental decision that colored every decision we made after that. And you can imagine that suddenly all those debates go away. Suddenly you don't have to have that conversation for every single feature. It's like, no, we're doing it job seeker friendly. So past decisions help you focus future decisions. And those decisions are your principles. Now it's important to note that principles are not just values. 
How many of you have something like build a delightful user experience, make something people want, or excellence as a value or a principle in your business today? Show of hands. I'm seeing a few hands go up. I'm seeing a few other people like realize I'm about to call you out, so maybe chickening out from raising your hands. These don't help you make decisions. We all want to build delightful user experiences. Have you ever gone into a meeting going, hey, I have this great idea. We're going to build this really shitty user experience. And then someone goes, wait, that's not in our values. Of course not. But it also is the same thing everyone else says. So some research from my friends at Zing showed that almost every tech company has these very fluffy, kind of unhelpful values. And there's nothing wrong with talking about how you want to work and embracing those as values, but they're not helping you make decisions. So principles have to be a framework for decision making. And to do that, they're very specific about trade-offs. One of the most powerful tools you can use to create principles is to use something called an even over statement, where you're deliberately calling out that trade-off that you want to make. So you might decide that you're focused on conversion, even over revenue. You might, like Monster, say that you're focused on the job seeker, even over the recruiter, and so on. You might recognize these from the Agile Manifesto. And just like the Agile Manifesto, we're not saying the things on the right are not important. We're just saying that in any trade-off conversation, the things on the left are more important. So good examples out there include Google, focus on the user, and all else will follow, much like Monster did. Shopify, another two-sided marketplace, flips that on its head and focuses on the merchants first, because they believe in their strategy is to have the most amazing merchants and that way win customers that want to come and buy those goods. Klarna at one point got super specific and said conversion trumps profitability optimization, because they wanted their teams to focus on getting the customer even if that meant not eking out every last cent of profitability. Supercell, the gaming company, has long-term retention over short-term retention. Now again, they're a gaming company. Of course they're going to care about day two retention. They live and die by day two retention. But they want their teams to focus even more on long-term engagement and long-term value. Second of all, principles align with your decision stack, right? As we, sh as we saw earlier, if, if pieces of the stack are missing, the whole thing breaks down. So principles have to align with the rest of your stack. But also, everything that you said no to as you're developing the other pieces of the stack is probably a principle. Principles also let you spend time on the really important decisions. It's not about making these up in an ivory tower and handing them down. These are hard-won decisions, right? You want to go do the research. You want to talk to all the stakeholders. You want to have a loud, possibly angry debate and discussion about the pros and cons of a, of a decision. But then you want to codify it. And you want to go, OK, we've had the conversation, job seekers even over recruiters. We've all agreed that. We've looked at the data. We've looked at the evidence. And although I took a crap on values, principles let you make your values actionable. So instead of saying, build a delightful user experience, you might do what Pinterest does and say, it's intuitive, not learned. Helping their teams focus on easy to understand, intuitive experiences over relying on things like support and onboarding tools. Instead of saying, make something people want, you might do what co-op does and say, build design for everyone. Encouraging their teams to focus on accessibility and usability. Instead of excellence, you might say, fast is better than slow, like Google does. So you can see how to use your values in ways that make it actionable and specific to you. So good product principles describe how you want to build your product and the trade-offs that you're willing to make. They're specific to your company, your strategy, and vision. They're actionable, memorable, and fundamentally, they make it easier to make decisions. Bad principles, on the other hand, are the kind of meaningless fluff for just kind of superficial, generic values. And therefore, they don't differentiate you. We all want to build delightful user experiences. How does that differentiate you from your competitor? And that fundamentally don't help you make any decisions. We're not reinventing the wheel here, right? 
This is about product and startups and business strategy and business principles, but design already has tools. We have design systems. We don't debate the color of the button every single time we add a new button or a new style or a new form. We've had that debate. We've done the research once. Engineering has the same. They have their coding principles and, and standards that they discuss and adhere to. Product and strategy and business need the same tools. So at EQT Ventures, um, one of Europe's largest VC firms, I help all of our products, or all of our companies with these kind of product challenges. And I wanted to show some examples of what it looks like in the real world. So first up is Code Sandbox, kind of a next generation development environment where it's a, a collaborative, cloud-based, multiplayer environment where developers can all work together on the same code. And so their principles include teams over individuals because they know that that's the strategic differentiator to every other developer environment that's out there. They talk about integration over composability, and they talk about sensible defaults over configuration. And that last one's kind of a two for one, right? Because it helps them make decisions, but it also makes lives easier for their users by reducing decisions for their users. Another example is KiteMaker, kind of a next generation issue tracking tool, or as I like to talk about it, a Jira killer. Their principles include things like collaboration over documentation, because they want to be a tool where design, engineering, and product work together, not one where you just document things and throw it over the wall to somebody else. They have one about meeting their users where they work so that they know that they can't replace and they want to integrate with leading best practice tools like Figma, Slack, and GitHub. And they fundamentally call out that they don't want to be just another issue tracker, so they want to think differently about every decision they make. <coughs> And my last example is Vev, kind of a next generation, again, web design tool. It's kind of code for the engineers, but no code for the designers, so that everyone can work together uh, as seamlessly as possible. And they have <coughs> principles around activating teams over individuals, again, focusing on what is valuable to them and what makes them different from everyone else. They were focused on product engagement over revenue optimization, and focused on bringing designers and engineers together in one tool. Of course, the market shifted a little bit, and they had to readjust that a little bit. So now they're focused on predictable ARR growth over revenue or over product enhancements. And that just shows that these principles aren't static, right? They evolve as your strategy has to evolve. But they're still focused on activating teams, because that's how they drive that value. And they're still focused on bringing designers and engineers together in one tool. So product principles help you make decisions. But how do you actually get started? Well, from the bottom up, use your retrospectives. At the end of a sprint, at the end of a quarter, however often you do them, and you can't do them often enough, have the conversation. What are the debates that we're having? What are the disagreements that we're having? Do we need to have that conversation once and then codify it as a principle? And what have you said no to in that sprint? Because that's probably also going to be a principle. From the top down, if you're a leader, reinforce your strategy by articulating those trade-offs. What is really going to make you successful? What is really going to make the strategy successful? And fundamentally, help provide focus for your teams by helping to say no. So that's the decision stack. And if we go back to our two by two, it really helps us in a few ways. So first of all, strategy helps reduce the number of decisions that you have to make because you're focused in on a certain set of problems and focus. And your principles help reduce the options for every decision. And fundamentally, that's how I believe that we can move back to having more deliberate decision making. So that's how you make better decisions faster. Whether you're a product manager, a product leader, or in this room, a designer, an engineer, a founder, a COO, whatever your job is, this is all a shared responsibility. So keep asking questions until your decision stack is clear. Keep answering questions by doing the research, talking to customers, looking at the data to help drive the decisions you make throughout the stack. Make sure that your strategy and principles are synchronized. And then set the right cadence, right? Your vision is probably static, maybe not even something achievable in your lifetime. Your strategy is somewhere between 18 months and three or five years. If you're a startup, it is until your next funding round. Your objectives are six-week sprints, quarterly, whatever kind of works for your team and what you're building. This, this does evolve, obviously, as a startup. Early, very, very early days is probably even faster than that. Once you're more established and you're scaling, you can go to quarterly cadences. 
Your opportunities are in constant flux as you're learning new things from your market and your users. And your principles evolve somewhere in between, responding to change, but continuing to reflect your strategy and your vision. So I want to leave you with a final quote. One of my favorite business authors, Peter Drucker, who's written an insane 39 books in his lifetime, said that whenever you see a successful business, someone once made a courageous decision. So use the decision stack to make better decisions faster, because that actually helps leave room for those courageous decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Normally, we have planned time for Q&A. There's not that much time left for Q&A now, but that's fine because we have like another 30 minutes of questions for Martin. He will be in a talk during the next slot and will be interviewed by Anne Kittler from Facelift. So if you want to know more about the decision stack and how to use it in practice, just stay here. <laughs> We're happy to have you. One thing might be interesting for everyone who wants to leave and see some other talks, are there any resources like online about your model? Yeah, so I mean, if you go to thedecisionstack.com, uh, you can sign up, it's completely free. I'm writing about it there on a semi-regular basis. Uh, the slides will all be up there to download for free. And also, after our session with Arna this after, uh, right after this, we will be writing up some of the business cases and, and studies mm -hmm. that he's been making with other firms that are using the decision stack today on that site. So that'll be all be coming out and help you really see that there's different ways to do it, because there's no one right way to do any of this, right? Okay, perfect. So we will be back at 10.35 with the interview with Martin. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.